the bull by the horns. Um, food addiction is something I personally have seen um, in my own practice and coaching people on and off for 30 years. And I didn't really know it. I know when I was in school, it was, it was not even it was considered, didn't exist. And there still are critics out there who'll say, oh no, that's, you know, some crazy idea from the people in California, you know, and, and, and it's uh, not 100% recognized yet. Uh, so how would you respond to that criticism? Well, it's, it's, food addiction is a very different thing than every other addiction because we can't quit food, right? Every other addiction is something that we can quit, something that we can, we can dramatically alter our relationship with, but we need to eat. We need to eat regularly. We need to eat every day. And so it's something that you can't quit. And I, I think that it's something that's gaining awareness more and more in, in the field, but it's not yet something that's accepted as a true addiction in the way alcohol addiction or drug addiction or any of those other things would be. However, a lot of the ways it manifests are the same. I mean, when you look at diagnostic criteria for alcoholism, I mean, we're looking at differentiating between alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence, and both of those have diagnostic categories. Yes. And you see how one can kind of lead to the other, and you see that very, very often in the way people use food for reasons other than feeding their body, when they use food emotionally, when they use food as escape, when they use food as reward, when they use food as anxiety relief, almost the way they might use medication or something else. So you see it kind of move from, from abuse to dependence in a lot of the same ways you see with drugs and alcohol. So there's, there's a, a very clear correlation between the two, yet I think that the, the concept of food addiction as a diagnosis, as a diagnosis is, is probably coming, but it's not you know, fully accepted yet. So I, I think we're on the path to making yeah, that, that a, real, a real accepted thing. Absolutely, I, I know if, um, a few years ago, um, my wife and I were with some friends over in Italy and we were um, down in Pompeii and checking out uh, the place with a guide and he pointed out one of the, the old villas. We, we were in the ruins of it and said, oh yeah, then this is probably where the vomitorium was. And so, you know, that was, that was a real thing there. It wasn't like, you know, the, uh, the gorging and, you know, yeah. obsessive, obsessive. that was a very, very common thing. It wasn't, there was apparently wasn't much any shame about it. It was just, well, know, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It wasn't, wasn't viewed negatively. The idea of, you know, either let me, let me make myself throw up so that I can eat more or let me eat as much as I can, because I know I can do this after to make myself feel better. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was almost socially accepted, right? And now it's, it's part of criteria for several eating disorders, right? Um, right. The oh, idea of, of engaging in these compensatory behaviors so that you can overeat and you can, you know, stuff yourself, you know, feel in control or escape or whatever it is that people are doing. Um, it's this, this compensatory behavior to deal with either the guilt or the associated weight gain or any of these other feelings that are associated with this behavior that's being negative. Right. Amazing. Well, you know, that brings to mind an, another, another question, and this is part of the shame that, that a lot of people would feel, is I've had, had you know, customers who would come to me and they'd say, listen, you know, I'm so disciplined in my work. I'm, I've been exercising, you know, for all my life, and yet now I can't stop eating at night or mm -hmm. maybe it's i can't stop eating after my you know my kids and and spouse go to go to bed you know and they don't even know about it you know mm -hmm. but i'm gaining all this weight and i'm yet i'm still going to the gym at six in the morning every day have you yep. dealt with anyone in that kind of case yes i mean i i hear something very similar a lot and what i hear is you know, I, I got it down in every area of my life. I can, I can be in control. I can be on top. I can succeed. And I just can't do it here. I just can't do it with weight or dieting or my relationship with food. And part of that definitely goes back to the fact that, again, we need food. Food has been a part of our daily life as long as we've been in existence. So it's not something that we can put the same limits on mm -hmm. like we can with the gym. It's also not a choice to eat or not eat. We have to eat. And so it completely changes the relationship that we have with food. 
And most of us develop these unhealthy, these unhealthy issues around food at a very young age, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're issues that are developed through the way our parents presented food to us, you know, the, the forcing us to clear our plate idea, or, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people grew up with the, they're starving children somewhere, so you have to eat. Oh, and, yes. <laughs> and, right? All of these things that completely disconnect us from, you know, what's going on with us physically, understanding hunger and satiety, and just looking at something external to govern how we eat and how much we eat. We all also often grew up with the idea of food as reward. Yes. Right? The idea that when, when we do well, we're treated to sugar, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, that we, if, if we clean our plate, we even get more food, yeah. food you know, high fat food as, as a result of doing that. So all of that sets us up for this incredibly unhealthy relationship with food where food is not about, you know, sustaining our body. Food is about all of these external things. And when you look at that, right, most people don't have that kind of relationship with the gym or with their work or, or things like that because they weren't manifested at such an early age. That's a much harder thing for people to change. So what, would, what is, in, in, if we could maybe have, say, a hypothetical you know, patient comes to you with, and they're dealing with that exact thing. They've got their life together on pretty much all areas except for, you know, controlling the food and, and weight and that sort of thing. What would be step one? And, or could you maybe walk us through, you know, a hypothetical case study? Sure, sure. I mean, step one is, is to just see what's happening, right? And um, I usually have people just start tracking their eating, not in a um, calories and macronutrients way, mm -hmm. but just the, when are they eating? What are they eating and why? Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of the, the why factor that's critical, right? Okay, I mean, that makes sense. And I, yeah. Cause I have people come back to me and you know, 70% of what they're tracking, why they're eating is because I'm hungry and that's fine. It's the 30% that's not that is what calls my attention. I'm eating because I'm bored. I'm eating because there was just food in hand's reach. I'm eating because, you know, everybody went to bed and I was able to eat in secret. Mm -hmm. um, I'm eating because I had been on a diet for two weeks and hadn't allowed myself to have any sugar. And then I was around sugar and I wanted to just eat all the sugar, right? All of these other reasons that come up that cause people to eat. And, you know, once I have sort of awareness with whoever I'm working with, of, you know, what are these other reasons that are causing them to eat? And also, when is this happening? Because sometimes you can find patterns. It's always happening at, you know, 11 o'clock at night when everyone's asleep. Or it's always happening between 5 and 7 p.m. when, when I get home from work, but before I've had dinner. And mm -hmm. not realizing that, that I, I haven't eaten in five hours. And I'm actually really hungry, but I'm waiting till dinner. And in the meantime, I'm doing all of these things to, to save myself, to, to get through that period of time. So, you know, really kind of understanding when this is an issue and what are the emotional parts of it that are triggering that behavior. And then using that, I can kind of dig in personally to what's going on with that person because it's not a one size fits all thing, right? Everybody has their own triggers. Everyone has their own history. Everyone has their own emotional relationship with food. And so I, I feel like you need to address that where that person is as opposed to just addressing it globally. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and would, could we talk briefly about, um, you know, not to go too into the weeds, but if, if we talk about the brain itself, I mean, there's, and this may be a bit theoretical, but there's the idea of the reptile brain and then there's the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, if I can get that out. Sorry, I've been awake too long today. <laughs> 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 and um, so the the reptile brain is going to maybe some would say, you know, perhaps oh, could you say we override some of the you know the discipline factors that maybe the prefrontal cortex would would uh, would that be a way of uh, would that be accurate to say that or am I butchering that analogy? I, I, it's not inaccurate, but I tend to look at it a little bit differently mm -hmm. um, in terms of well, for starters, you know, from from a real Freudian standpoint, you're kind of talking about you know the id overriding the ego and the super ego, right? The yeah. I want my immediate needs met as opposed to looking at my long term needs, right. and then there's this whole like overarching view of self sabotage and how that kind of plays into, I know better, I know what to do, but I'm not doing it. Right. And what tends to happen is people are very focused 
when, when they're in an emotional state, when they're experiencing anxiety or stress or something like that, their, their brain and, and their hormones and their neurotransmitters, I mean, cortisol in particularly kicks in and has them solely able to focus on the present. I want something that's going to make me feel good for the next five minutes. I don't care about the next five hours. I don't care about the next five days. And so what I want is high fat, high sugar, right? Something yes. that's just going to calm that part, maybe give me a little bit of a dopamine release and make me feel a little better. And I'm not connecting the dots with how am I going to feel in an hour mm -hmm. and how am I going to feel tomorrow? And so a lot of what I do with people is help them connect those dots, help them start asking those questions in the moment because almost always whatever they're eating to feel better in the moment is momentary. It may last five, 10, even 20 minutes. But afterwards, all of those negative emotions they were experiencing that caused them to eat are still there. And now they have a few others, oftentimes yes. guilt, oftentimes shame, oftentimes this, this whole layer of self-attack and this perception of poor self self-efficacy and mm -hmm. you know just lack of belief in their own abilities to control themselves <coughs> so now bless you we have all of these negative emotions that started it and now we've tacked on a whole bunch of others and then maybe we go even further and the next morning they step on the scale and they're not happy with what they see on the scale so now we have even more and the problem is in the moment we're thinking i'm stressed i want food and there's this direct connection these synapses are connecting right there with nothing in between and we need to put all this other stuff in between so we can start to say, wait a minute, this, this isn't going to make me feel better. And I'm going to feel worse for all these other reasons. And that's not what I want. So what else can I do? Right. And so when you get to that point, okay, you, you've identified the, the problem areas, you've identified maybe some of the emotional, you know, architecture going on under the hood. What is, is, if, is there any, you know, cognitive um, tools that, that you would work on? I mean, I'm sure you have plenty of things. Do you have some go-to, you know, yeah, recipes? For sure. Um, in the world of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, one of the hallmarks is the identification of cognitive distortions, which is basically, you know, ways that we distort reality um, to fit into like our existing thought schemas. Mm -hmm. And there, there are like 13 of these, I believe, but everybody has like a few that are their go-tos and I can give you some examples that most people can relate to. Um, a really common one is all or nothing thinking mm -hmm. or black and white thinking. The oh, idea of yeah. seeing things. Yes. In these terms of either all in or all out. And you see this very commonly in people's relationship with food, right? Mm -hmm. I'm either on a diet where I'm eating chicken and broccoli for every meal, or I'm off a diet where I'm eating everything under the sun and I don't care about anything whatsoever and there's no vegetables in sight. Right? Yeah, nothing in between. This, okay. this black and white thinking. And, you know, the extreme nature of it is what, what causes the back and forth, right? The, the strictly chicken and broccoli is what caught that restriction effect is what causes somebody to swing to the other side and, right. and do all that. So, you know, in an example like that, the idea of identifying all or nothing thinking helps you work on establishing, you know, gray thinking, as, mm -hmm. you know, embracing things like an 80, 20 mentality, or, you know, understanding where they can, where their behavior is extreme and how they can let up on that just a little bit to allow for a little more fluidity, a little more moderation to break the, the, the yo-yo impact, right? The idea of moving to the other extreme. Um, so, you know, another, another example that comes up quite frequently of a cognitive distortion is called dwelling on the negative, which is, you know, the idea, sorry, the other example was uh, dwelling on the negative, dwelling on the negative. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I use this example a lot with people because most people can relate to this. Um, you know, we can go through our day and do 100 things, let's say, and we do 99 of them right. And one of them wrong. Wow. And at the end of the day, the only thing we're focused on is that one thing we did wrong, right? right? The, re the reality is we should be, be patting ourselves on the back like lunatics saying, I'm amazing. I did 99% of things right. How, how awesome am I? I'm like a superhero. But instead, we're sitting there going, I can't believe I screwed that up. I'm such an idiot. I'm always making mistakes and, you know, dwelling on the negative because we are we are basically ignoring all of that positive and putting all of our energy into that negative. And that doesn't help us. 
it's not motivating, right? Beating yeah. ourselves up doesn't give us all of this empowerment to move forward and make things good in our lives. It sets us up to repeat that behavior. And so when you can identify that as a behavioral issue and start looking at how do we find the positives? How do we force that, right? Let's look at our day and now identify the 99 things we did do right and putting emphasis on that, putting energy on that, putting focus on that positivity. Um, even if it's just about starting your day with a positive thought or going throughout the day and saying, what can I pat myself on the back for today? It's not about saying I didn't do anything wrong, but it's about saying, let's put attention on the positive, to change the impact of the thinking errors. So those are some examples of, of cognitive distortions and how um, you can use things like that to change these behavioral loops. Right, right. Oh, that's, yeah, that's fascinating. And what about the, you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of times we get these programmed ideas, you know, as children and the idea of, of um, you know, we need to please our parents or we need to, you know, and so um, I know here in, in Spain, and I've got a lot of friends in Italy, if you go to somebody's house and you don't eat at least a little bit of everything that they mm -hmm. can, you know, Mama's gonna be upset. She can, yeah. you know, she may not say anything, yeah. but you, you once you get into the family structure, okay, then you then you just start to hear it. But if you're just coming in as an outside visitor, you know, maybe they give you a, a free pass. You know, mm -hmm. so there's yeah. so I can notice that going on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's not just in Italy. I call it like the mother-in-law syndrome. The mother-in-law right? syndrome. Yeah. yeah, and it's the idea of like food is love, right? Yeah. I, I've cooked for you. This is how I'm showing you my love. You accept my love by eating it. Right. And um, in and of itself, it's okay. It's just about you know portioning, awareness, planning. It's when it feels like doing that is wrong. Or again, looking at that all or nothing thinking that, that it's going into the nothing category. And if you eat that person's food, now you've completely gone 180 degrees off your diet. So you might as well just stay there and continue to eat yeah. everything, right? It's the mentality that goes along with it. So how can you allow that in moderation in a way that feels controlled, in a way that makes you feel like, you know, gives you that perception of control, which is the most valuable thing in the world. The control piece is irrelevant. Our perception of control is what really matters. Because if we believe that we are in control, that belief is what carries us forward. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think um, something that I've been, I've found some success with uh, myself, um, as well as with with some of my coaching clients, is is actually just being really, really honest. Not you know, if it's going to be a, a, a reoccurring situation, you know, talk, just you know, talking to the person away from the meal and and just saying, hey, listen, you know, I really appreciate you cooking, you know, this what you're making and blah blah blah. It's so wonderful, I love that. But you know, I've got this situation and and I just it doesn't, I can't eat that even though I'd like to. You know, like mm -hmm. in my case, I actually uh, realized I was pre-diabetic about ten years ago. And I used to be eating a super high carb, thin, high carbs and doing all, you know, even the, I was even doing some triathlons, you know, you think you're, you're burning off all the carbs, but actually it's still, you're still got to process all of that. And I didn't yeah. realize, you know, didn't realize that that wasn't working for me. So I've got to be really careful with the carbs. And, uh, and so I've been able to, to explain to my mother-in-law, gosh, I would love to eat the, your tortilla española, which is like the frittata in, uh -huh. uh, in Italy. And, uh, and so now what I'll do, I'll just have a small piece. I'm just like, you know, I'd love to eat the yep. whole thing. You know, I used to, I probably would have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's a good example, right? I mean, somebody who has, you know, a, an actual health reason, you know, whether it be diabetic or pre-diabetic or a gluten intolerance or lactose intolerance, I mean, those are easier things to say I physically can't. But, you know, the idea that you hit on that's really valuable is, you know, have a little show massive appreciation yeah. and then you know have a simple way to address it i'm so full or i already ate or you know yeah. I, I will definitely eat it later i love it it's incredible thank you so much i'll take them home i'll have it all day right yeah. it's not about needing to eat it all right there in front of them but about showing them the awareness and the appreciation of you know the, the gift of love that they're giving you and accepting that love yeah that's that's a that's great yeah that's another one we'll actually well, and she'll, she'll prepare enough for, you know, four meals. And, mm -hmm. uh, 
And so I said, that's exactly what we started doing. We'll say, gosh, you know, that's so awesome. You've done that. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. we'll take it. We'll have food for the next three days. So, mm -hmm. so it's, yeah, that's perfect. We're happy. We're happy. Every, you know, we just dose. It's like, you know, do dosification. Yeah. Yes. Volume control. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, gosh, there's so many, so many different ways we could, different things to talk about here. Um, have you, um, I'm just curious, have you heard of um, Dr. Glenn Livingston? He has a, he has a, a book called Never, um, I think it's called Never Binge Again. Oh, interesting. I haven't. I, I, I know a lot of the, the binge eating authors, but I'm not familiar with them. He's, I, I just, just downloaded his book. So I've, um, anyway, it's an interesting, it's an interesting book. Um, well, let's, let's shift gears here a little bit, if we could. Um, could, what would you, would, would, when you're working with someone about with eating problems, who problem, oftentimes, you know, has a weight problem, uh, who's not doing exercise, how do you normally start a non-exerciser on an exercise program? Um, I or, usually or, or start them. Just one at a time. Yeah, well, a, a non-exerciser to get exercising, um, one of two things. Either I have them commit to do something five minutes a day, like, you know, follow a YouTube video for five minutes or, you know, do jumping jacks and sit-ups for five minutes or something along those lines. Or I have them identify something physical that they either have enjoyed in the past or that they think they would enjoy, something that feels fun. Mm -hmm. Right. For a lot of people going running doesn't feel fun or, mm -hmm. you know, going to the gym and lifting weights doesn't feel fun, but going for a bike ride does or, you know, doing, you know, an aerobics video does or playing tennis does. So helping them find the thing that they think they would enjoy. And then again, I have them because I see people like weekly or um, biweekly having them commit to do that thing just once in between our session and our next session so that they can try it out, but that it doesn't feel like a massive task, right? It doesn't feel like they're setting themselves up for failure. So using an example like that, somebody who maybe they really like bike riding, mm -hmm. and I give them a homework assignment to do a bike, bike ride between now and our next session. Almost always they will come back having done more than one bike ride because their homework assignment was just to do one, which was an easy task for them. It didn't have a time limit. It wasn't do one for an hour. It was just do a bike ride, any distance, any speed, anything, just go for a bike ride. And usually because there was no pressure and they felt good about themselves at having succeeded and they enjoyed it, they want to do it again. And yeah. so they go out and do it again. And, you know, it's from a long-term standpoint in regards to exercise, if we want to maintain exercise, it needs to be something we enjoy. If it's torturous, if it's painful every time, we're not going to stick with it. So anybody you know who's a long-term exerciser is doing something that they enjoy. They're not doing something that's horrific for them that they dread every day. And that usually comes with a little bit of trial and error and trying things sure. on until you kind of find your sweet spot. But as long as you can get somebody just to start something and to start feeling the effects of physical activity, which is kind of where I go next, if they've been doing that for two or three weeks, and then we can look back at maybe their journals or their logs or just kind of their life and say, how have you been feeling? How's your energy been the last few weeks? How are you sleeping? Right, what's your mood been like? And they can start to connect the dots with oh, that's you know, doing this thing and, yeah. and how it's making them feel because all of those things start to get better when a non-exerciser starts exercising. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. It's, it's, uh, so that's, a little, that's similar. I'm, and I'm, you know how some, a lot of times people have these, there's a, this is similar to the idea that uh, BJ Fogg, he's a, are you familiar with him? He's a Stanford University um, psychological researcher, I guess you call him. But he has this, he has the exact thing. But I'm, you know, I'm sure it's not just his idea. Obviously, obviously, I mean, starting small and just building up, you know, a mm -hmm. positive feeling. Because just like we were talking about how growing up, you know, where a lot of times we're told, oh, they're starving kids in Africa, you know, finish your food and, right. you know, and, or at, in playing sports, we were told, you know, if you screw up, 
if you jump off sides in football or you get, you know, you foul out of the basketball game, you've got to run laps. You know, it's like running was the punishment, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. so most of the guys that I used to play sports with are, are now just, just blown up, you know, and they're, they're, you know, way overweight and that kind of stuff. And they hated exercise, you know, they yeah. were much better athletes than me, but, but they hated it because of that, that kind of, yeah, thing. makes sense. Yeah. So I like that just the small habits and then just building up that positive intrinsic focus, mm -hmm. of how you're feeling. That's awesome. Yeah, well, and it, and it makes us feel successful, right? Yeah. Um, you know, when we have a goal to exercise six days a week, which, you know, an example would be like New Year's resolutions, right? A lot of people make New Year's resolutions of I'm going to go to the gym every day or I'm going to go running every day or something that, you know, sets them up for failure because as soon as they don't reach that, they think I failed. Right. You know, my goal was to run six days a week and this week I only ran four, so now I'm a failure. But if my goal was to run two days a week, and now I ran four, I'm a superstar, yes. right? Because I've gone above and beyond. And it's not about, you know, creating low expectations, but it's about creating barriers that you can run through and say, I'm going above and beyond, and now I'm going to set the bar higher. So it's kind of building baby steps, right? So that you can keep moving forward as opposed to having to move right here and then Having to drop back yeah, which is which is basic which is impossible for almost everybody and you know unless i did have a guy who was a, a a former you know army ranger he'd been out of exercise for like 12 years and yeah he could flip the switch i i still with him though i had to like counsel him to like slow down because his mind was like already out here and mm -hmm. the thing is he was still overweight he could he could injure you know his joints and you know, or blow out his knee or something like that. So I had to like tell him, like, listen, you know, if you blow out your ACL, and if you, you know, want to, he wanted to go back, back to skiing and doing the black diamond slopes. And I'm like, Man, let's let's take it easy. Let's do that maybe next year. You know, <laughs> but that's a rare case. You know, that's a yeah. rare. But I really appreciate your your approach to that. That's um, that's wonderful. Uh, let me let me think about one other area here. And that, and I guess, do you do you find it's is it important to actually have the you know to label something as an addiction? Because you know a lot of times people say in common day to day you know life, oh I'm addicted to chocolate or I'm addicted to ice cream or or I'm obsessed with this or I just really like it. You know, um, does it matter? Is that important in in dealing with these kind of problems or is it not? Important? Not necessarily. I would say it's very person specific. Some people need that categorization. Some people need to be able to say, I'm this, and mm -hmm. that's why this is happening. So that, you know, it gives them some framework to understand it and then to work from. Not everybody needs that. Some people can say, I just, I have a pretty unhealthy relationship with food and in this area and this area, and I want to work on that. Whereas other people need, need the label to be able to say, this is what I am and that's why I need to do that. So it, it's very personality based. And you know, just like in, in any other field of mental health, somebody who struggles with anxiety issues may need the diagnosis, may need to be able to be told, you have generalized anxiety disorder, or you have panic disorder, or you have obsessive compulsive disorder or social anxiety disorder. They may need that label Whereas other people may be able to say, you know what, I know I have some anxiety issues I want to work on. Right. And I so, I you know, everybody's different in terms of what they need. So from my perspective, on my side of it, I don't need the label, but I can use it for people who do. Right. And that's where it becomes effective. And how are you able to, to sense that? Do you have like a, like a spidey sense of... I, I mean, a little bit, but it's, it's just in the way that people talk about themselves. I mean, you, you identified it yourself when you said people are like, oh my God, I totally have, have a chocolate addiction as opposed to somebody who says, I really like chocolate, Yeah. right? And so you can just kind of get a feel for it in the language that people use and the way that they talk about themselves, you know, what they feel they need to be able to move forward. So you just get a feel for it as you talk to somebody. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, wow, well, this is, I've gotten, that's most of what I had on my notes here. Um, the, the thing that, that I would, I was just wondering is, 
If there's anything, is there any, are there any new areas that you are, you know, looking at as far as whether they are areas to help people with in, in this area, anything that's new coming down the, that, you, that maybe you're excited about that uh, people don't know too much about yet? I mean, I, I'm not sure if these, these are new areas, but they're areas where there's always new research emerging mm -hmm. um, and um, particular sleep and its impact on weight. Um, and then also mindful eating, which has been something that's been very well researched, but there's always kind of newer and cooler research coming down the pipe yes. on that that gets me excited. But sleep is one of those things that, that's really fascinating. And um, I, I treat insomnia now. I became a certified insomnia treatment clinician because I was working so much on sleep with my weight management population. Yeah. Um, because sleep is so integrally tied in to so much of our hormones and our hormones are so in charge of our weight and our eating and our eating behaviors. So, um, you know, people think it's, it's odd at first that when they come to me for weight management, I'm asking them all these questions about sleep and trying to work on improving their, their sleep quality, their sleep schedule, their sleep duration, their sleep environment. But it's, it's so tied in because when your sleep is poor, when um, your sleep duration is too low, all of your hormones get out of whack. And, oh, yeah. you know, we have these hormones that have been kind of identified. I mean, this is in the last you know, 10 to 15 years, um, leptin and ghrelin are hunger and satiety hormones, right? These, these hormones that tell us to eat or these hormones that tell us to stop eating. Right. And if they're out of whack, if they're not where they need to be, we may be physically satiated, but yet we have this hormone saying, eat, eat, eat. Yes. And if that's going on in our brains, it doesn't matter how we feel in our stomach. We're going to eat. And, you know, we have this other hormone that's supposed to tell us when we're full. And if that doesn't kick in, we're going to keep eating because we're looking for a cue physiologically to tell us we're done. So sleep is one of the most effective ways to keep those things in control. And um, you talked about, you know, being pre-diabetic and, you know, insulin resistance is oh, the, yeah, the, the yeah. primary precursor, right? Oh, and, yeah, exactly. That was, that was totally part of my, uh, mm -hmm. part of my problem. I mean, yeah. No. And, you know, our, our insulin balance is also impacted by sleep. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the better our sleep quality, the more responsive our insulin is. And again, when you look at these other hormones, leptin and ghrelin, if those things are out of whack, they also influence our insulin. So all of these things that impact our eating behaviors, our relationship with food, our, the way we store body fat, the way our metabolism functions, all of these things can be severely impacted by poor sleep. Yes. So um, the idea of kind of sleep is something that always gets me excited to work on with people. Yeah. Because it, yeah. it sort of feels indirect as a route to take, but it's actually a surprisingly direct route to help people in this area. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, I, look, I look back, it was a blessing in disguise for me to realize that uh, my, uh, my fasting glucose was, was, was about almost 130. And uh, when I was tested and, and uh, because of that, I really had to go back into my, why? And how could this happen mm -hmm. to me? You know, all my friends think I'm the healthiest guy they've ever seen and blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, it was, it was sleep. It was too many, too many carbs uh, and, um, you know, probably too much alcohol too. Um, yeah. you, know, you know, it wasn't compared to, it was all relative when you're around people who are drinking a lot and you're only drinking two or three drinks, but two or three drinks for me every night is too much. You yeah. Know, well, it's specific to everybody, right? And, yeah. you know, to, to your point, I mean, none of these things exist in a vacuum. None of these things exist independently of one another, right? Everything is tied in. When you're talking about weight, when you're talking about physical health, right? It's not just about the food you're eating and whether or not you're getting exercise or how much exercise you get. But sleep is a critical part of this. Your, your stress levels are a critical part of this. Your, your general self-care is a critical part of this. Your, all of these lifestyle factors like alcohol, right? They're, they're all a part of this equation and it's a sure. complex equation. It's not as simple as calories in, calories out. Yeah. Well, I see, I, I know, I see with a lot of people and myself included that if I have to be, if I get into that bad, the bad cycle, you know, not enough sleep, 
then, so what do you do? You compensate with more caffeine and I love coffee, uh, but I have, a, I now, I know my metabolism limits and I know when to, you know, I need to cut it off after about three o'clock uh, and to go to sleep at 11 PM for me, that works. But that's why I didn't want to have coffee before this yeah. <laughs> exercise and feeling good. But uh, um, so, but if I did have it or, or other people, if I do have late, later afternoon coffee, then I feel like, oh gosh, I really want, want to have wine tonight, even though I wasn't planning on it. I'm, you know, and I need, to, oh, well, now I need to have two glasses of wine to lot of compensate and lower that adrenaline and cortisol I've got from the caffeine. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, you fall asleep, but you don't go into your deep REM stage. So then you wake up and once again, you're not feeling good. Yeah. You yeah. get the quality. Is that, is that something? Yeah. Too. Yeah, I mean, you may think I slept all night, but like you said, you've probably stayed in stage one and stage two, these light levels of sleep, because, you know, alcohol in particular, and then you add in caffeine, right? These things are, are blocking your ability to move into deep sleep. Mm -hmm. And they're acting almost more like a, a sedative, right? Or they're, they're keeping you unconscious, but at this lower level of unconsciousness. So you're not actually getting the the restorative benefits of sleep all come from stage three and four. So if you stay in stage one and stage two sleep all night, you're going to wake up and think you've slept all night, but you're going to have all of these negative impacts. Right. And right. that just creates that vicious cycle you talked about, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, having my wife and I had a, a surprise uh, son that came to us four years ago. Um, and uh, he was, that was another really hard thing at first, but then I realized, you know, that's, I need to do every, I need to really, you know, buckle down and, uh, because he's a light sleeper. He would wake up, he's still <laughs> up today he woke up at five. So, <laughs> so he's in his, in his bed singing the alphabet. In, <laughs> he starts singing jingle bells and then he comes in and into our room and he says, Papa, I want to go downstairs and, and I want to draw something, come play. And I'm like, oh my God, I went to sleep at midnight. <laughs> Anyway, well, this is awesome. We've got some great material. I think people are going to be really excited to hear this interview. And um, I think this is probably a, a good time to start winding it down. I do have one question, a uh, really simple question I like to, to, uh, to ask uh, most people. And that is, if you could have a billboard advertisement that you could plaster around the major cities of the world, what message would you like to leave or put up there for a month? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I say this all the time to people, but self-care is not selfish. Okay. Is something I tell people all the time because people think putting time and effort into themselves is, is a negative, selfish act. And I think it's one of the most effective things you can do to take care of yourself and to help and possibly take care of all the people around you. When, you know, I talk to maybe a working mom who, you know, she, she has a husband, she has a child, she has a home, she has a job. All of these things come before her in terms of, you know, taking, taking care and meeting needs. And so she has nothing left, you know, her, her metaphorical cup is empty. Yes. And if she were putting time and effort into taking care of herself, she would be doing a better job with all of those other things. She would have more patience with her child. She would have more attention and energy to give to her husband. She would have more focus and energy at work. All of these things get better when we take care of ourselves, when we meet our own needs, when we fill our own cups. Absolutely. So self-care is not selfish. That's, that is awesome. I love that. I think that's a, that's a, a wonderful, a wonderful, you know, point to uh to, to to finish this up on and uh so dr candace Setti, uh thank you so much hats off to you for uh, for all your all your great work and great ideas and uh and great communication style i can see you've done a lot to do you do very well with these things so so keep it going thank you so much thank you for having me it's been great chatting with you yeah yeah same here same here so that's, let me just go ahead and turn off our recorder and I'll just.